Okay, so welcome to our second to last lab. And this lab actually puts together some of the previous information that we learned in say the sedimentary rocks lab and the igneous rocks lab and applies it to a lab about the geologic time scale, about how we figure out the age of different rocks to make the geologic time scale and how fossils are a big part of that. And so the, this is the second to last lab. The last lab is an earthquakes lab that will happen next week. And then on Tuesday, April 27th, I am just going to do a review for the take home final exam. By that point, I'll have a study guide. I'm hoping to get it out possibly next week. But uh, that time is also a good time to work on labs. If there's a lab that you've missed or something or there's one that you've been meaning to read meaning to do a second attempt on but haven't gotten to that yet um i will be around to help then so that is a good time to do that and then i will also be around on tuesday may 4th which is the last week of the term as far as i know um it's definitely the last week of the term it's just not clear to me whether there's a finals week that's set aside at abc compared to some other places um, there's also a seminar happening today that i mentioned before that is worth checking out if you want to learn about um if you want to learn about an application of the geosciences. And also it is a chance to get extra credit if you want to attend the seminar and write about it. There will be a couple more in the next few weeks. So the geologic time scale is made by looking at rocks. It's not that we find rocks and fossils and we put numbers on and we put numbers on them and say this rock is Paleozoic or this rock is Cenozoic. Yes, we do that, but we first had to figure out actually when these when these intervals of time were from looking at the rocks themselves. So time as we understand today in terms of hours and days and centuries extends much, much farther back than human knowledge. We now know that the earth is billions of years old and we can actually put human history on the same timeline as geologic time, which includes the era of the dinosaurs and the age of fishes and the formation of the Earth and the Big Bang, we are still living in that time scale. We are living at the very, very tail end of it. If you look very closely at the end of this diagram, you can see an airplane um, and some human cities, which are meant to indicate this that humanity has existed at this very, very tail end of the geologic scale. And honestly, this isn't quite this isn't quite proportional to scale either. This is made this is exaggerated just a bit. Um, and we have existed only for a tiny proportion of Earth's history. We have come up with the, the geologic time scale and intervals of geologic time using rocks and fossils, not the other way around. We haven't, we haven't first come up with these intervals of time and then assigned rocks and fossils to them. We've actually defined these divisions largely by the different types of fossils we found and the different types of rocks. And Humans have divided Earth's history first into eons, which is by far the largest um, interval of time. And you might have heard the term eons used in sort of a colloquial sense, like that was eons ago, and that's meant to indicate that that, that happened something that happened an uncountable amount of time before. And we are actually living in an eon right now. We're living in what's known as the Phanerozoic Eon, which is essentially everything since ever. Ev which is essentially everything since the Cambrian explosion, since most groups of life appeared. The time before that, which is known as Precambrian time, is divided into several eons also. And we do have some fossils from that very old time, but not very many because as we'll talk about, older rocks get broken down and the fossils that are with them go, go goodbye in the process. We break eons into smaller eras like the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And what is, what's another word for the Mesozoic? What, like what happened during the Mesozoic? What was alive then? Dinosaurs? Yep, the Mesozoic is the age of dinosaurs, precisely. And then the Cenozoic, which we're living in right now is often called the age of mammals um, because most dinosaurs are extinct now, except for birds and mammals have taken over their um, ecological niches. And You've, um, you've at least heard of the movie Jurassic Park. Jurassic refers to one period within the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era is composed of 
the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods that are defined by largely actually by changes in the abundance and variety of dinosaurs during those times. Um, and you can divide periods even further into epochs. And epochs are usually used for more recent time because the fossil record is better and we can get a better resolution look. We can get a better, we can get a more close up look at the changes in climate, in the rock record and in fossils. Um, a mnemonic that Dr. Bird came up with was to wait to remember what's what's biggest and what's smallest is eons erase periods of pox, which I think is kind of amusing. Eons, eras, periods, epochs of pox is used because it sounds kind of like epochs. And again, the younger the rocks are, the better the, the, the better the rock and fossil record is going to be and the more detailed divisions we can make. Kind of the same with history. We can, we know the year to year or even the month to month um, script of history from the last couple of decades or centuries, but then you go back way in time and people just refer to the Stone Age or the Bronze Age in general terms because we don't have a lot left from that period, though we certainly have a lot left from that time than we do of the oldest geologic time. So any questions about the geologic time scale as a whole? Yeah, I'm so, um, I'm kind of confused on when it says eons erase periods of pox. Like, what exactly does it mean again? It's meant to it's meant to it's meant to show which of these terms eons, eras, periods, and epochs, which is largest and which is smallest, to help keep you in order. Oh, okay, okay. Yep, it's just a mnemonic device if tell if you need to if you need to keep them straight. Don't worry about it too much. So. We have several tools at our disposal to figure out the age of rocks. And this is actually a picture from a national park that I've worked at, John Day Fossil Beds National Monument that is famous for its record of mammal fossils from the Cenozoic era from after most dinosaurs went extinct. And this picture is a good example of two separate methods of dating rocks being used together. And we have two ways to date rocks. We have absolute dates, which is when we take usually an igneous rock, a rock that formed from magma, and we can use radioactive dating to actually get a number that corresponds to when we think that rock cooled. Relative dating involves comparing different types of rock and using the fossils in them and structures in the rocks and comparing them all to one another to figure out how old the rocks are. Now, with relative dating, we don't end up coming up with an exact number for it, but we'll often use relative dating together with absolute dating to figure out a range. So sedimentary rocks are not very easy to perform absolute dating on. Why might that be? Why might it be difficult to take, why might it be difficult to obtain a single age from say a clastic sedimentary rock like a sandstone or conglomerate? Probably because it's just like broken down rock over- Exactly, yeah. precisely, yeah. It's made, of, it's made of lots of different broken down rocks and those rocks all have different origins potentially. If you attempt to take the age of one grain that might tell you when the rock that that grain eroded from formed but it doesn't tell you when the sedimentary rock formed. So yes, precisely. Um, but what we can do in this, what we can do in this picture is we have two igneous layers, we have a layer of ash that's highlighted here that's been dated at 35 million years. And MA refers to millions of years. It means mega anum or, or millions of years. So ma means millions of years. We also have a lava flow at the top of this that has been dated at 32 million years. And it makes sense that the smaller number, the younger rock is gonna be on top. Almost always the younger rocks are going to be on top. That is a that is a fundamental rule of stratigraphy or of using relative dates. The only exception is you can occasionally conclusively prove that a layer of rock has been overturned, but that's a pretty rare example. Here you have these two separate dates. And so if you know that the rock on top is 32 million years old and the rock on and the igneous rock on the bottom is 35 million years old, what can you say about the sedimentary rocks between them? about their age. Yeah, they're like 34 or 33. Yeah, precisely. They're somewhere between 32 million years and 35 million years. And you don't you can't exactly come up with a number, but you have a range. And this is actually this is actually a quite 
good constraint here. Three million year, a range of three million years is excellent by by geology standards. This is we often we don't often have as nice um, we we don't often have as nice of bracketing as we do here. And actually, one reason why this park was set aside in the first place was because all the ash and all the lava flows help, have helped them figure out exactly when most of these mammal fossils were formed. And that's not something that's easy to do in most cases. So absolute dating relies on radioactivity. What you do is you assume, and this is a little bit tricky, but you assume that the minerals in the igneous rock, like the biotite or the amphiboles or the feldspars that you've looked at, or more commonly, little minerals that are known as accessory minerals that are uncommon, but have a lot in them that can be studied. And they're often not that easy to see in hand sample as well, as I'll show. But you assume that the minerals cooled very quickly, that they cooled around the same time as the magma itself did. And that can be a little bit complicated if you have lava flows that cool in increments. So it can be a little bit of a tricky assumption. But what we do is we use radioactivity. Absolute dating is all about measuring the amounts of a radioactive isotope of an element, such as uranium-238, versus a daughter isotope that results from the breakdown of that radioactive isotope. And for example, uranium-238 is radioactive. It is an, it is, um, an isotope refers to a particular combination of protons and neutrons for a given element. Because if you remember what the number of what subatomic particles like protons and neutrons and electrons, the number of which one of those determines what an element actually is. Between protons, neutrons and electrons. So for reference, not something that's super important for this class, but it's the number of protons. So different, so two atoms of say lead can have different numbers of neutrons. One can have more than the other and they can still be counted as lead if they both have the same number of protons. The reason I bring this up is because neutrons don't have a charge, but they keep the nucleus or the core of an atom stable by holding everything together, by providing enough space between protons so that they don't repel each other and cause the whole thing to fall apart because two protons are positively charged and they're going to repel each other. This is important because some isotopes, some combinations of atoms of uh, neutrons and protons are more stable than others. And uranium is an example of an element that doesn't have any stable isotopes actually. It just happens to have some isotopes that have a very slow rate that they break down. And for an individual radioactive isotope, it has a number called a half-life attributed to it. And you've probably come across the term half-life before. It's a series of video games um, that I don't know. I, don't, I haven't played those games, so I don't know how accurately anything related to nuclear fallout is that they talk about in that game. But the half-life is a number. The half-life is the period of time in which half of the starting amount of the radioactive isotope has broken down into the stable daughter isotope. Because nuclear, excuse me, um, radioactive isotopes break down over time and they break down exponentially. We consist, we can, for an individual radioactive isotope, measure the half-life and that is a well-established, well-known fact. We can use that half-life to work backwards in the sense that we can look at the amount of lead in a mineral versus the amount of uranium and actually calculate how many half-lives have passed. So for example, if two half-lives have passed, how what, what percentage of the original radioactive stuff is going to be left? When one, light, when, when one half-life passes, you have half of the original stuff left. Quarter? Yep, precisely. And then, there, and then three quarters, uh, and then the rest is all going to be lead or whatever um, whatever non-radioactive daughter isotope comes from this. And this is what I mean when I say it's exponential. 
you'll notice that um, this on the y-axis, this refers to percentages and you start out with, um, um, oh, actually, sorry, this isn't, this isn't percentage, my, my apologies. Um, but the reason I brought that up is that um, you are going to start out with a set number of radioactive parent atoms. And often you assume that there is no, there's no decay product already there. That is a difficult assumption to make. And we often have to correct for the presence of there being some, some lead to begin with. One of the minerals I'll talk about, zircon is really useful because um, it normally will actually take up a small amount of uranium. Remember how we talked about impurities in minerals like calcite? Sometimes uranium gets taken up. Sometimes small amounts of uranium get taken up by in calcite, but also in minerals like titanite and zircon that we haven't talked about in this class, but that are used for absolute dating. And zircon doesn't take lead up. So what will happen is that the uranium will break down into lead and we'll sort of assume that any lead there formed as a result of uranium breaking down. And we can compare the relative amounts of uranium and lead to figure out how many half-lives have passed. And this is an example using another radioactive isotope, carbon-14. And if you've heard about carbon dating, this is what carbon dating is referring to. There is one isotope of carbon that is radioactive. It's not very common. Um, it's present in very trace amounts in artifacts made of animal hide or in mummified hair, mummies in general. Um, it has a relatively short half-life though, actually. It, um, and so it's not particularly useful for most geologic, studying most geologic processes, except the most recent ones. We often use uranium for geology because uranium has such a long half-life of several billion years, in fact. But so carbon-14 breaks down to nitrogen. We start out with 160 atoms of carbon-14. After one half-life has passed, and the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years which seems like a lot to us, but is quite short geologically speaking, because in geology, we are dealing with millions or even billions of years. After one half-life has passed, we have 80 atoms of carbon-14 and 80 atoms of nitrogen-14. Uh, and after a second half-life has passed, we only have 40 uh, atoms of carbon-14, a quarter of what we started with, and we still have 160 atoms total. We're assuming that nothing's really entering or exiting the system. It's a closed system. So thus 120 atoms or three quarters of 160 are going to now be nitrogen 14. After a third half-life has passed, you're going to be down to 20 carbons of 14, uh, atom, atoms of carbon 14 and 140 atoms of nitrogen 14. Now, in practice, we're usually dealing with much, we're usually dealing with many more individual atoms than this. And an exponential decay, nothing ever completely goes away because you can't divide something by two to get zero, but it will eventually get down to a level where it's essentially undetectable. The parent will essentially disappear, will, will, will essentially become so rare that it's undetectable after not that many half-lives. And so we don't use carbon dating for objects that are older than, um, older than a few tens of thousands of years really because after a million years most of the carbon-14 will just be gone because it's so unstable and has such a short half-life. So a half-life is a period of time whether that's years or millions of years. Does anybody have questions about radioactivity in general? I do. So the the number of atoms never changes. It the total doesn't change. It's just which one's more or less. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. Because you'll notice if you take if you take this column and add it to this column, it, the, the total is always going to be 160. 160 plus 0 is 160. 80 plus 80 is 160. 40 plus 120 is 160, and so on. OK, thank you. Yep. Um, and this is not really something on the lab, but I'm just including it because I think it's interesting you have to separate the minerals to get absolute dates. And separating minerals is very time consuming and also very expensive because A, it requires a lot of hours of work. So um, you have to be paying someone or someone's using a lot of their, lot of their graduate research time to do this um, at the expense of other stuff. So you need to 
you need to have a sense that the rock you're working with is one that's likely to have this mineral before you start wasting time crushing it. And then also the equipment used to do this is often quite expensive. And what you need is a mineral that has the parent isotope, the radioactive isotope that doesn't have very much of or possibly none of the daughter isotope. You need a lot of crystals because you can't, you can't really obtain a reliable date from a single crystal, it turns out. And um, I will say that if you get into mineral separation, it's good to have a good grasp of statistics because a lot of actually obtaining a meaningful date from this involves statistics. And the mineral that I worked with for my uh, graduate thesis actually is this mineral, zircon, which is very hard to see in just the hand sample. You usually have to spot it under a microscope, but it is very, it's a durable mineral that incorporates uranium, but not lead. And it's very commonly found in igneous rocks like the ones I was studying. And it took me a lot of time to separate, to take the rocks, like the, um, if you've seen the, the Antarctic pictures, the dark rocks and those are the rocks I was working with. And I first had to, I first had to saw off the weathered parts. Remember that from the sedimentary rocks lab, you, I mentioned that you, if you're doing any chemistry on the rocks, you want to get rid of parts that have experienced chemical weathering. And then um, I had to crush the rocks using this jaw crusher thing that is named because this could, this could destroy your, this could, dis this, this could destroy your hand <laughs> if you stuck it in here. Don't do that. Um, we actually use a gold table also, which is used to separate gold from just quartz sand usually, but it's also useful for separating zircon from just everything else in the rock because zircon is heavier than the other minerals. Um, we then separate zircon from some of the other stuff with magnetism and then with methylene iodide, which is an extremely expensive and toxic um, liquid that's used for a density separation. And lastly, you end up staring in the microscope and physically using tweezers to put the zircons by themselves and put them in a mount, put them in a, put them in an epoxy mount that will then go to a mass spectrometer where lasers will blast it. And the mass spectrometer is a device that can detect the amount of uranium versus the amount of lead. It's also in some cases sensitive enough to tell one isotope of uranium apart from another isotope of uranium. Um, and this is one thing I alluded to when I said this is expensive because this machine is very expensive and it's costs a lot of money to spend time on this. Um, and then the data that comes from this machine has to be processed in an Excel program. It doesn't just it doesn't just put out a sheet of paper that says this rock is 45 million million years old. That would be cool, but it's not quite as simple as that. The point of this isn't to make you memorize a bunch of steps with mineral separation. It's to show you that getting absolute dates is really hard. And absolute dates seem better to have in a lot of cases because you want to be like, oh, this rock is 25 million years as opposed to I think this rock is somewhere between 25 million years old and 40 million years old. But we can't get absolute dates from everything. And this is why relative dating is so important, why it is really important that we know how to compare rock layers to each other and make conclusions about when the rocks were deposited from that. And I actually find that a lot of the rules of stratigraphy or the study of how different layers of rocks relate to one another, a lot of those rules come down to common sense. For this lab, there are four rules that really come into play. Um, in the notes from the lab, Dr. Bird mentioned that she talks about some others in lecture. I don't know exactly what she's talked about this term, but these are the four that come into play in this lab. And so we assume that sediments were deposited flat and that the sedimentary rocks that formed from them were also flat or horizontal to start out with. We also assume that the, um, the younger rocks are on top. The principle of inclusion has to do with the different layers or with the different classes of sediment in a sedimentary rock. And it basically states that if something is included in something else, then it is older than that something else. The clasts in a sedimentary rock, like the pebbles in a conglomerate, are older than the conglomerate itself if we're talking about when the conglomerate ceased to be sediment and became lithified into a sedimentary rock. And the last rule is that if we have a feature that cuts across or disrupts another one, like an igneous rock that's cutting through horizontal sediments or a fault that's distorting bedding, we can safely say that the cross-cutting feature is newer and that whatever it is cutting across came first. 
And I will go through all of these in a bit more detail, but any questions so far? So for original horizontality, it comes down to the fact that sediments are going to settle in a flat place. They're going to settle in a valley or they're going to settle in an ocean basin or a lake basin. That is where they will compact into sedimentary rocks under their own weight. If you have sediments landing on an intensely sloped surface, they're just going to keep rolling down under the force of gravity. Now, you do sometimes see sedimentary layers that are tilted, that are not horizontal. The bottom of the Grand Canyon has a number of sedimentary layers that are tilted at an angle. And what that means is that they haven't always been like that. That means that formerly horizontal layers of sedimentary rocks were disturbed by something like uplift caused by tectonic forces that caused them to be distorted, that caused them to be tilted at an angle. Because the sedimentary rocks, once they're solidified, aren't going to roll down the hill necessarily the same way as the um, the same way as just loose sediments are. They might erode faster. Um, it often turns out actually that um, when this happens, the layer that's sticking up gets eroded more because simply put higher up things and points sticking out erode more. The points erode first and gravity actually contributes to mountains and higher up hills or higher up layers of rocks being eroded first. And what you'll see here actually is that newer the newer sediments have been deposited on top of this flat um, there was actually something happen that happened here, um, a period of erosion that we'll talk about later that took this away. Superposition is basically saying that the oldest sediments are going to be on the bottom and also the that, that, that feels like common sense to me. It's like thinking about this example of a classic just too many papers on this desk and it's clear that there have been, there's just been stuff piling for days or months. And unless something happens to disturb this, like if a human specifically reaches at the bottom and takes something out, then you're going to assume that if they have files for a project from 2018, those are going to be buried down here somewhat. And the files from their newer 2021 project are lying on top of that. And the older sediments are going to be overlain by younger sediments because the sediments don't have a mind for themselves. They're simply falling. Whether that's clastic sediments like sand or mud or ions precipitating out of the water as chemical sediments. You can only, it is possible to prove, no, it is possible for layers to be overturned. And there's usually good evidence for that. Like there's usually, this usually occurs in an area that's experienced a lot of uplift and they usually won't be tilted quite all the way around. They'll usually be at an angle, but you have to prove that. Cross-cutting tells you that if a feature cuts across something else, then it is younger than that something else. So for example, these, um, these are some of the dikes I was studying in Antarctica, and these are actually igneous rocks cutting across other igneous rocks. And the granite, the gray stuff, is making up the, the country rock, the making up the background of everything. And cutting across it are a number of these black dikes. And you actually notice there's a pink dike that has a different chemistry than, that has a different color than the black dikes and it's chemically different. And it's also younger because you can see that it cuts across and disrupts both the granite rock and these black dikes. It cuts across one of these black dikes here and another here. And so it is the youngest rock. And the same can also be said of something like a river when a river cuts through layers of rock to expose them. This is why you'll have often on either side of a valley or a canyon, you'll have the same sequence of rocks visible. And it looks like someone sort of cut into a layer cake almost, like someone cut into the middle of it. And that's what the river has done. The river has cut into the layers of sediment and the river formed after those sediments were deposited and turned into rock. Oops, pardon me. And here's another example. Here's a, here's a good example of um, an igneous dike cutting across layers of sedimentary rock that are more or less horizontal. And this happens because igneous rocks are again formed from these blobs of magma that can that don't necessarily settle flat. They can be injected into cracks or into weak points, or possibly if there was a fault here, then the 
igneous rock was able to get into that. But the main point is that these layers, these, these layer cake-like layers of sedimentary rocks were here first, and this igneous dike that cuts across it came second. And what about it? So here's a simple example. Here's another example that you can test yourselves on. Um, what I want you to think about is that D is cut off here. D cuts across layers B, C, and E, but not A. It just kind of stops here. This surface is drawn sort of squiggly. And often on these maps, when it's drawn that way, that's to indicate that erosion has happened. So what came first? Was layer A, which is a sedimentary rock, deposited first? Or did rock D, which is an igneous rock, cut through first? Wouldn't it be D? D is older than A, indeed, because D does not cut across A. D does cut across these other three layers, but you can see that it was that it's it itself is cut off by this period of erosion. And A was just deposited on top of everything else. So yes, if something doesn't cut across a sedimentary layer, that tells you that that layer formed younger than the thing that that than than the other thing. As for the principle of inclusions, it mostly comes up with sedimentary rocks. There is one specific example with igneous rocks where it also comes up. If you can, for example, identify pieces of chert or sandstone or granite or gneiss within the pebbles making up a conglomerate, then all of those rocks that the class came from, all of those rocks that were broken off into pieces to form the pebbles that after that were solidified into conglomerate, well, as, as common sense would say, those older rocks, those, those rocks that broke down to form the conglomerate and form the pieces in them, they're older. Meanwhile, this also is invoked with igneous rocks. You'll sometimes have cases where magma will intrude into another rock unit and you'll, it will not be particularly clear which came first, but if the other, if pieces of the other rock can be found in the magma that tells you that the other rock is older. And that's what's going on here. You have bits of this older rock that have that got broken off by the magma and didn't completely mix with the magma because of chemical differences. And that tells you, OK, this surrounding rock is older because we find pieces of it in this metamorphic rock, excuse me, in this in this magma. So any questions about this, about the different roles of stratigraphy? And I've thrown another example in here that you can test yourself on. And this is what I mean when I say that rivers cutting across other features, well, that means the river's younger. Because all of this happened, like the Larsenton formation was deposited, the Foster City formation was deposited, the Hamlinville formation was deposited, and the Skinner Gulch limestone were deposited before a river started cutting down through any of this. And that's often why we actually go to places like the Grand Canyon to study geology, because the river has, in that case, exposed rocks quite deeply. In fact, we have some very ancient rocks um, that have been exposed at the bottom of the Grand Canyon that we otherwise would not have access to. And indeed, that Heather, yes, that last rock was, um, it was polished, which is one reason why it looks so nice. Um, um, I like both polished and unpolished rocks for different reasons. Now, the one thing to consider is that I've mentioned that our rock record is not perfect, and we often have, oops, pardon me, and we often have situations where we can tell that rock used to be between two other layers of rock, but it's since gone missing. A conformity is when we get lucky and we have the rocks in order with no gaps in time. We can determine that, we can determine that there's not really much missing time. More frequently, we will have sequences of rocks where there is what is known as an unconformity. We have missing time as a result of erosion. Erosion breaks rocks down, and when the rocks are broken down, we don't have rocks from a given period of time to study anymore. And this will result in rocks that are, that are from vastly different times in the geologic time scale being right next to one another. Um, and so what's going on here actually is that we have 
layers of sediment that have been tilted over this other layers of sediment that you can see are at different angles. And one type of unconformity we'll learn about is an angular unconformity. Um, so angular unconformities occur when, they will occur when horizontal sediment layers lie over tilted sedimentary layers. And what's going on in this example and in this diagram is that the older sedimentary rocks have been tilted by some geologic process, by uplift, by earthquakes that took them out of their original horizontal position. I alluded to the fact that these tilted layers will often erode faster because they're sticking up. And what will happen is that during a period of erosion, these will be broken down and then eventually more sedimentary deposition will start over them. Often it'll actually happen, um, often this actually has to do with sea level changes. It'll, there will be erosion when the rocks are exposed on land. And then if say the sea level rises to cover up them with water, then more sediment will start being deposited in the ocean. Like you'll start finding, in this case, limestone, which um, they often draw limestone as this bricky thing and limestone forms out in the open ocean. So this probably tells you that this rock that was on land was flooded by ocean and you've started getting ocean sediments over it. But we don't really have a great sense necessarily of what amount of time has passed between this unless we can find rocks elsewhere that do fill in the gap. Sometimes what we'll find is that rocks will erode more in some areas than others and will correlate these sequences across vast distances. But the point to remember here is that angular unconformities exist when you have flat sediments lying over tilted sediments. And this is what I was alluding to before. The layers will start, will start horizontal, something will deform them into a fold, they'll be eroded, and then when, when deposition begins again, the sediments will just be dropped over them. And in the Grand Canyon, you can see this over here, right above the bend in the Colorado River. There is an angular unconformity um, where actually some mostly horizontal layers here are overlain by some um, Actually, pardon me, these layers below are tilted. It's just, the, this is the angle I took my, just that I took my picture from, but the ones below are tilted and the ones on top of it are horizontal. And that actually corresponds exactly to the diagram I showed you earlier of the Grand Canyon. There is an enormous unconformity of several hundreds of millions of years missing from the time in which these rocks were deformed and the time in which these rocks were deposited. Now, Igneous and metamorphic rocks um, are useful for absolute dating, but they tend to cause some issues with they tend to cause some issues with stratigraphy because they don't really follow the rules in terms of being deposited flat. They kind of just go anywhere they want. And if you have an example of sedimentary rocks overlying igneous or metamorphic rocks, we have what is known as a nonconformity. And the reason that it's confusing is that it's we can get an absolute date from the igneous or metamorphic rock in some cases, but we can't then get an exact date on when deposition began. We can we can make educated guesses, but we don't we can't come up with a number that says, okay, this igneous rock formed at 15 million years, and we can come up with another reliable number that says deposition began at 16 million years or at 14 million years. Excuse me. And that's what's going on here. You have this blob that is an igneous rock, and then that was eroded down at some point. The other thing to consider is that the igneous rock might have been eroded for whoever knows how long, and then deposition begins at some other point. We can say that these layers of sedimentary rock are younger than the igneous rock, but it's hard to say exactly how much younger. And here's another picture of the one occurring. Um, here's another, there's one occurring in the Grand Canyon. And it, in addition to the angular rent conformity, there is a non-conformity near the base where you have sedimentary rocks that are overlying just this blob of igneous and metamorphic rocks. And um, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon is where the oldest rocks are from. And a lot of the oldest rocks on earth have become metamorphosed because they've been so deeply buried in earth's crust. And the Grand Canyon is actually a very lucky place where we have ancient rocks exposed like this because the river has cut down so much. There's been a lot of uplift and a lot of river cutting down and that has exposed some of these ancient rocks. The last, type of not, um, the last type of unconformity is a disconformity. And I realize that these are named rather similarly. Um, angular is pretty easy to remember because they're at an angle. With igneous rocks, I remember that, oh, igneous rocks don't behave, so they're non-conforming. And then disconformity is the variety that occurs when you do have two 
when you do have two sedimentary horizontal layers overlying each other, but you can tell that there's been erosion between them. They'll, they'll be, um, the layers won't quite lie flat on each other. They'll be, they'll be sort of jagged up and down indicating that the lower sedimentary rock was eroded significantly at one point, And then later on sediments were deposited on top of it. But it's again, hard to say exactly how much time is missing. It's hard to say exactly when the erosion of the older sedimentary rock ceased and when the deposition of the younger one began. And these also often have to do with sea level changes because if sea level drops, that's going to expose more rock on land. And rock doesn't really break down when it's underwater all that much. It'll chemically break down a bit, but most erosion happens on land. Most erosion happens when rock is not underwater. But if sea, so you'll get more erosion when sea level is lower. When sea level rises, you'll get more deposition and less erosion. And so there is, there is one problem in this exam, or excuse me, in this lab where you'll be putting together a sequence of different events. You'll be using, um, you'll be using the order in which the layers are on top of each other and clues like cross cutting to figure out when, um, when different events occurred. And some strategies I can give you are that it's often easiest to start with either finding the oldest or the youngest, depending on which is easier, and starting from there. You want to assume that the rocks are right side up, unless someone has stated otherwise, and that's usually not going to happen. And you have to remember that if something cuts through something else, it came after that something else. And if the rocks aren't horizontal, they must have been at one point. So in this example, if we want to find the oldest layer, we're going to want to look towards the bottom. The oldest layer is going to be C because C lies below everything else. And also with the things that have caused cross cutting, like we have a fault, we also have this, um, we also have this dike, but those, those cut across C. Um, B is definitely going to be younger than C because it is on top of C. Um, and A is definitely going to be younger than B because A is on top of B. Then the question comes into when the different cross cutting events occurred. You will notice that um, you'll notice that D kind of cuts across almost everything, but D itself is disrupted by something else. This this represents a rep represents a fault. This represents that movement has occurred to shift these layers, and you'll notice that E has disrupted C. It's put part of C below the diagram, so we can't really see it. It's disrupted B, so that um, this would normally be a continuous layer, but faulting has happened and moved part of D, D, B down. It's done the same with E as well. And D has also been affected by this. D doesn't cut across the fault. The fault cuts across D. So the order would be um, C, B, A, D, E. And that's in a nutshell, the thought process you use when solving problems like this. So any stratigraphy questions before I move on to fossils? So fossils are important because they actually often give us a bit of context for figuring out when these different layers were deposited. Fossils are actually a powerful tool to help us determine that two rocks in different areas were formed at similar times or that two different rocks um, are quite different. And a fossil is any evidence of ancient life. It's not just bones, it's, it can be something like a footprint or a leaf impression or a shell. And fossils usually represent creatures that were only alive for a pretty short time. And we can use their presence or absence to decide whether, decide um, just how old the rock that it's found in is. And we can also trace the evolution of organisms through the presence of different fossils in the rock record. We can compare, we can say, um, we can find shells that paleontologists will determine represent older species of clams, more primitive species of clams, and compare and 
they can tell them apart from more recent species and determine that rocks in which one type of clam are found are older than rocks in which some other clams are found. And in a, in a, you can either, for fossils, you can either have evidence of the organism itself, like you can have um, bones or a shell or the imprint of a leaf, which is known as a body fossil, or you can have something that is evidence that a creature was there, like a footprint or a burrow or this thing, which is um, a, does anyone know what this is off the top of their head? Just, just, just out of curiosity. These layer, it's it's a it's a type of fossil made of layered layers tree? of sediment. Um, good guess. Actually, this this actually does look a lot like um, look. This does actually look like a is fossilized like a, tree rock. Like a stonified tree. Um, this particular one is not, but that's a good guess because this does actually some some petrified wood. Um, the stonified tree you mentioned can look like this. This is actually a stromatolite, which is made. Um, it's one of the earliest fossils we have, and it's made from layers of bacteria or cyanobacteria trapping sediment. Um, and the cyanobacteria don't produce fossils really, but the layers of sediment left behind by them do get preserved as rocks. And so that's evidence of ancient life, even though we don't, even though it doesn't actually show the organism itself. And um, fossils are not very common, all things considered. The, we have very few fossils, all things considered, and we have very a very small percentage of the diversity of ancient life still rem that we, we have we have a very a very we, we we have an idea that there's been a lot more organisms alive on earth than we have fossils of the fossils we have are a very small percentage of the total diversity of life that has existed over the course of the presence of life on earth and a lot of organisms that don't have hard body parts like if we're talking about fungi fungi are, do not fossilize very well because they don't really have any any hard parts. We also have animals like worms that like earthworms that don't have hard parts either and don't easily form fossils. The things that tend to fossilize are structures made made in stone or in sediment like the stromatolites or footprints, bones, shells, um, wood fossilizes fairly well. So that's when we get plant fossils more often when we're dealing with trees or plants that have woody parts as opposed to grasses or um, flowers that bloom for one year for one season and then disappear. And even for animals that animals that or plants that do have hard parts, the animal might completely decay first. Bones do get broken down by microorganisms actually, just more slowly than the flesh itself. And the best chance for an organism to be fossilized once it dies is for it to be buried by sediments before the skeleton can be completely destroyed by decomposition or before it gets scattered around. And we have a lot of fossil deposits that are from floods burying a large number of animals instantly. It might jumble up the fossils and make it a bit of a task to figure out what came from which animal, but the, the water and the mud that get, gets carried by the flood actually buries the animal and preserves them. And what'll happen in the what'll happen when the animals get buried, or when the plants get buried, is that the usually the hard parts will be replaced in their original shape by new minerals. And so, the bones that we have of dinosaurs usually aren't the exact same material that was present in the living dinosaur, but the mineral that replaced it has given us essentially a full a full cast of the of the of the bone that was originally part of that dinosaur. And often we actually use, um, we often can use fossils to figure out the depositional environment of the rock, because in some cases where the fossils are of animals or plants that are pretty familiar to us, like clams or, um, or bits of wood, that'll tell us, okay, this, um, likely this sandstone comes from a land-based environment, where, because we have because we have evidence of mammals in here and we have evidence of evidence of shrubs. Or you might find clams in sandstone and you can say, okay, this sandstone came from an ocean environment instead. And the fossil record is basically our library of fossils. It is the it is only a fraction of the actual diversity of life that has existed. And we're often forced to say the fossil record is poor in regards to a particular interval of geologic time because we don't have a lot of fossils from it. In many cases, because 
there aren't a lot of rocks left from that time. So older rocks are much more likely to be eroded than younger rocks. We are less likely to have ancient rocks than newer rocks. And so our fossil record of life from ancient times is pretty spotty because of that. And also if organisms, we can also say the fossil record is poor in regards to specific organisms like fungi or earthworms. And that will be because they don't have hard parts. They, ha they don't have hard parts that fossilize well. And one thing you'll be doing in this lab is using fossils as well as, um, as well as sediment type, as well as sedimentary rocks to make guesses about depositional environments. And this is a lot of what paleontologists do. They look at the sedimentary rocks themselves, like whether something is a sandstone or whether something is a conglomerate or whether it's a shale. And they also look at the fossils in that sedimentary rock to confirm their guesses. One example is that you'll sometimes find shale, which is the mud rock in both lakes and in the ocean. And in some cases, scientists will be able to tell apart fossils of lake organisms of freshwater animals apart from those of marine organisms. And that'll help them guess, okay, this rock was formed in a lacustrine or lake environment as opposed to a marine environment. And the thing to consider about depositional environment is that where the rocks are now has absolutely nothing to do with the environment that was present when the sediments were deposited. The depositional environment, like the seafloor or a forest or a lake, is completely separate from where those rocks have ended up since. A lot of the rocks found in really dry, desolate places like the Grand Canyon are actually full of marine fossils. And that doesn't mean that these clams were flying around and ending up out in the desert. It means that these rocks formed out in the ocean. Something geologically has since put them on land and they've ended up out in the middle of the desert. But millions of years ago when those rocks formed, they formed underwater and they ended up having fossils of clams and trilobites and other cool marine organisms as a result. So any question about any questions about fossils? I just have a few more slides left after this. The last thing I wanted to bring back, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we do bring maps a little bit back for this lab. We talked a little bit about topographic maps before where you use contour, where you look at the different contour lines to figure out elevation. There's another type of map that you'll be looking at a little bit for this lab called a geologic map when instead the, the map shows where different types of rock are exposed. This map, um, which is a bit of a simplified geologic map of California, it doesn't show every single individual outcrop, but it shows you that it shows you where rocks from different eight, from different points in geologic time are exposed in California. Um, this red, for example, is the Cenozoic's. Um, it's the Sierra Nevada batholith. It's the granite. It's the granite, the intrusive igneous rocks that formed as part of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and you'll see that the blue represents Paleozoic rocks, rocks that are from before the dinosaur era. And you'll see a lot of those are exposed out in the desert, um, a bit more inland. And they've, for any map, you're going to want to find the legend. You're going to want to figure out, you're going to want to find out how the map is labeled. In this particular example, they've taken advantage of the fact that this map isn't showing the geology of Nevada at all. And you get this convenient space where California bends, where Nevada is. And so they've stuck all of the labels there. They've stuck a legend here to show you what types of rock these different colors correspond to. So that's the main thing you're gonna be focusing on for the part of this lab that involves the map. You're going to want to figure out, you're going to be figuring out where different types of rock in this legend are exposed. And one thing that you often, not with this map as much, but you'll notice with some geologic maps is that they'll often put it over a topographic map. This is one of my field area from Antarctica. And you can see that I have both a topographic map on the last slide and this map, which is a geologic map. This shows where different types of rock are exposed in the area I was working in. Um, it's hard to see, but the, the green lines represent the general locations of the dikes I was looking at. Um, 
a lot of maps like this will be at least a little bit hand wavy. They'll, they'll have a disclaimer that says, these stripes tell you that dikes are in this area, but each stripe doesn't tell you precisely where an individual dike is at, at this scale. And you can see that you can put them over each other. And it's often a useful way to actually figure out how different types of rock correspond to topography. Because as it turns out, different types of rock erode at different rates and will produce different landforms. And then this is just one showing my sample locations. So I've gone over a lot in this intro spiel, um, and there are a lot of different topics in this lab. I want to remind you that you are free to look at past labs while doing this. You are free to look at your notes. You're free to look at material from lecture, as well as your notes from lecture. And then there is a chapter in the Johnson textbook that you will want to look at. It is linked in Canvas in the intro text to this lab. And so the questions that you'll be answering today are some about what percentage of the geologic time scale, for example, is the Mesozoic era or the time in which humans have been. And there is reference material for that in the lab itself that shows you how that shows you how long humans have been around relative to, say, the age of the Earth. There's also an exercise where you'll be doing a proxy of radioactive decay. And what it has you do is take a number of coins and have and have you um, disturb them and they'll fl and the ones that flip i think it's tail it's specified as tails in the lab but you remove the ones that are tails each time and that's meant to simulate radioactive decay the the lab makes it look like you have to do this over and over again and you only have to do it a few times to answer the questions if you don't if you can't come up with a lot of coins an alternative might be um a, a silly example i thought of was you could get some you could get some cookies like my brain went to those famous amos cookies or something or oreos you could like take the top oreo off and you could flip the cookies and whichever ones land land um upside down you could remove and eat them later or something but you don't have to, i would say that if you have a hard time finding something to do that question with you can take your time to do that like you can take your time to get your hands on enough pennies to do that with. Um, and that's what I meant earlier when I said it's not absolutely crucial you finish every bit of this in the lab period, especially if that's causing you to rush. Then there's a couple of questions based on fossil identification using pictures provided in lab. Um, and the um, last couple of questions are comparing the ages of rocks to each other using the diagrams. Take your time, feel free to save and return if you need a break. Take the time to check all of your available reference materials and make sure to ask me if you're struggling with anything, especially with any of the short answer questions, because there's more of those in today's lab than there have been for the last couple of weeks. So any questions before I close the recording? Cool. And I'll say that some of what I went over in this lab was in a bit more detail than is necessarily needed for the lab. It was just to give you some context. So I'll shut the recording off and I'll be around here to answer questions.